We're in the middle of a series on the life of David. And when we left off last week with our hero, David, things were really, really bad. We looked at a story where he had made a terrible decision, got an entire town of innocent people slaughtered. The problem with terrible decisions is that they take us down as, as we go down, oftentimes we just make things even worse, right? And so in today's episode, this is another story of David that you probably haven't heard a lot, it's not well known, but we're gonna see him about to make another horrible decision that would make things even worse. But fortunately for David, at the very last moment, he is saved by a woman. Guys, how many of you have been saved by a woman at the last minute in the past? Yes, I, I, I want to thank Kathy for saving me from dumb decisions or mistakes many times in the past. Thank you. Um, before we jump into the story, let's talk about the golden rule. Who's familiar with the golden rule? That's weird. Okay. And I'm not talking about the one where, you know, he who has the gold gets to make the rules. That, that's not the golden rule I'm talking about. Who, who knows the real golden rule? Just shout it out, somebody. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Absolutely. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And, uh, you know, most of us know that. You know, most of you are probably taught that when you're growing up. You might not have even known that it's in the Bible or that Jesus said it, but you've heard it. And we all think that the golden rule is great until we get mistreated by somebody. And once I get mistreated by others, then I don't want to do the golden rule anymore. Once I'm mistreated by others, then I want to change the golden rule into a different rule. And the new rule would go like this, do unto others as others have done unto you, right? Do to that other person the same thing that they just did to you. That sounds fair, right? I mean, how could you argue with that? You're just doing back what they did to you, right? And so it actually feels right to treat them the same way they treated you. It actually feels natural. And it, it seems to be the right thing to do, the just thing to do, that when you're mistreated, you just treat people back the same way they treated you. But then what makes it even more complicated in real life, and, and we never really plan things out this way. We don't consciously think this way, and we don't even see it in ourselves, but other people see it in us. But what happens a lot is that when we get mistreated by someone that we can't get back at, then we mistreat other people. If you get mistreated by your boss and, and you can't really do anything to get back at him, then you mistreat someone else. If you get mistreated at, at school and, and you really can't get back to that other person, you just mistreat someone else. If you get mistreated in any environment, then it feels kind of okay or justified or right to mistreat someone else because that's how you got treated, right? You're not doing anything that somebody else already didn't do to you, right? So it's justified. Because the truth is that when we feel powerless in one relationship or one environment, we often compensate in another, right? I'll take it out on you because I can't take it on him or I can't take it on her. And so then our golden rule is translated into what I call the pyrite rule. Now, if you don't know what pyrite is, pyrite is fool's gold. And it looks kind of like gold, but it's totally worthless. And so the pyrite rule is do to others as someone else has done to you, right? And, and with the pyrite rule, you can justify all this any behavior as long as somebody's done it to you in the past. And the pyrite rule is what our world actually lives by today. Now there's a problem with this whole approach to life. And the problem with treating others as you've been treated, or as we would say nowadays, the problem with getting even is that it makes you even. And it makes you even with someone who treated you badly. You're even with somebody that you don't even like. Why would you want to be even with someone that you don't even like, somebody you don't even respect, somebody that hasn't even learned yet how to treat people right? Why would you be, want to be even with them? Because when you get even, you're acting like that person that you don't even like, and, and why would you want to be like the person you don't even like? And so with that as a basis, let's talk about David. This story takes place about 1,000 years B.C. It's about 3,000 years ago. 
There's a whole bunch of detail in this story. I'm going to have to skim through some of it, so I encourage you to go back and read it for yourself. But just to put it in context, David is 15 years old when he kills Goliath, and he immediately becomes the hero of Israel. He marries the king's daughter. He's the top military leader in Israel. But then something horrible happens. As we saw last week, King Saul becomes very jealous of David, and he sees David as a threat, and so he tries to kill David, and David becomes a fugitive. And he ends up living in a cave in the wilderness in the southern part of Israel. Well, as he's living there, hundreds of other fugitives end up coming to live with him. And so David actually has a, a band of several hundred men all living off the land and trying to avoid being captured by King Saul and his army. And that's where today's story begins. A certain man in Maon who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. He had 1,000 goats and 3,000 sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. Now, when we read that, we don't really know what it means, but if people in ancient times heard that, that he had 1,000 goats, 3,000 sheep, they'd say, whoa, that dude was really rich. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband, Nabal, was surly and mean in his dealings. In other words, he was a pain. Nobody liked him. And in fact, his name in Hebrew actually means fool. And he was his name. It turns out in the story, he was a fool. The story continues in verse 6. While David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So he sent ten young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Now, in the season when the shepherds would shear the sheep, this was like their annual paycheck. And so it was a generally a very festive time. There's partying going on. The owner is feeling generous. They come to the end of the season, he's feeling wealthy, and, and basically they're all getting a big paycheck. So David tells his men in verse 6, Say to him, Long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it is sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. And so essentially, David is saying, through the messengers that he sent, that basically, if you have a prophet, then part of your prophet is, is due to the fact that we protected your men, we protected your sheep. Because, you know, our men were in the wilderness where your sheep were and your shepherds were, and, and they could have stolen sheep from you, but they didn't. And not only that, they didn't let anyone else steal from you. We protected you. Then David asks, ask your own servants, and they will tell you. Therefore, talking to Nabal, be favorable toward my men, since we have come at a festive time. Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. In other words, since we were good to you, would you be good to us? Since we were kind to you, would you be kind to us? So David's men went to Nabal. They gave him this message. In verse 10, Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. In other words, he says, I know who you're talking about. I know who David is. He's an outlaw. He's a fugitive. He's running from King Saul. He's out of favor with the king. And besides that, I didn't ask for his help. In verse 11, he goes on, Why should I take my bread and water and the meat that I've slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men coming from who knows where? David's men turned around and went back. When they arrived, they reported every word. David said to his men, Each of you strap on your sword. So they did, and David strapped his on as well. You've heard the saying before that hurt people hurt people. And so you've, if you've been hurt by somebody in the past, then, then you may go out and hurt somebody else that didn't hurt you because hurt people hurt people. And this is where David is at. He has been hurt bad by King Saul. He had to leave his home and his wife. He's a fugitive living in a cave. He's being hunted by King Saul's army. It is totally not fair. He didn't do anything to deserve it. He's been hurt. And so now David is going to go hunt somebody else and hurt somebody else that he feels like has been unfair to him. And as David straps on his sword and begins his journey to find Nabal to pay him back for the sun kindness, David begins to do what all of us do at times. He begins to justify in his mind what he's about to do. We're going to see this in just a second. 
He begins having this imaginary conversation, kind of convincing himself that he's doing the right thing because he's honestly not sure that he is doing the right thing. Just like you and I often react to a situation and we're not really sure in the moment if we're doing the right thing, if we're reacting the right way, and, and you know, we suspect maybe we're not. And so what we do is we kind of talk to ourselves, don't we? And we justify what we're doing and we talk ourselves into it. But now we're going to meet the real hero of the story. In verse 14, one of the servants of Nabal told Abigail, Nabal's wife, David sent messengers from the wilderness to give our master his greetings, but he hurled insults at them. And so the servant was there. He saw what happened, and, and so he's reporting it to Abigail. He goes on, Yet these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us. The whole time we were out in the fields near them, nothing was missing. Night and day there were a wall around us. The whole time we were herding our sheep near them. Now think it about over and, and see what you can do, because disaster is hanging over our, he- our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. And so it says that Abigail acted quickly. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five seahs of roasted grain, which is like about 60 pounds of grain, 100 cakes of raisins, and 200 cakes of pressed figs, and loaded them on donkeys. Then she told her servants, go on ahead, I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal, which was a smart thing to do. In verse 20, As she came riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, there were David and his men descending toward her, and she met them. So basically, she knows which direction David is going to be coming from, and and so she meets him on the way. And here's where we find out exactly what David is thinking, because it tells us. David is talking to his men, and we see in verse 21, David had just said, It's been useless. All my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness, so that nothing of his was missing, He has paid me back evil for good. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. And so David is about to butcher people that he has never even met. He's going to kill not just Nabal, but all the males in his household. This means he's going to kill all the servants who had nothing to do with this situation. He's going to kill all the little boys. Every male is going to be slaughtered. If you were here last week, what does this sound like? This sounds just like the story from last week where King Saul slaughtered a whole town because of David. And so now David is going to do the same kind of thing. He's about to let loose of his rage that's been building up in him ever since he started getting mistreated by King Saul. And David is justifying it to himself. And he says, this guy Nabal, you know, I was good to him, and and look how he's repaid me. He's paid me back evil for good. Can you believe that? He paid me back evil for good. And, And because Nabal did that, he deserves to be killed. Not only that, he deserves for his whole family and his all the males to be killed. You know, he's justifying it in his mind. Verse 23, it says, When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. And this is kind of strange because she is a wealthy woman, uh, wife of a very wealthy, influential man, while David is an outlaw and a fugitive. He's a a dangerous person even to associate with. We saw that in the story last week. And it appears like it's just a matter of time until the king's men catch up with David, execute him, and that's going to be it for David, right? But here's this very wealthy woman married to a very influential person, and she bows down to King David. And in fact, this totally catches David off guard. And and what she begins to do then is she begins to treat David as if he is already the man that she hopes he will be. This is so interesting. She begins to treat him as if he's already become the man that she hopes he will become. And in fact, ladies, you want to maybe take notes from Abigail here. If you've got a man who maybe needs to change some things, this works on us even when we know what you're doing. Seriously. You know, when you make a man feel like he's really a better man than he's actually been acting like, when you make him feel better about himself than he really should based on his track record, men will fall for that just about every time. It's like, 
Honey, you are so strong. I'll bet there is no way you could take all those trash bins out to the curb with just one arm. <laughs> and we know exactly what you're doing, but it doesn't even matter. Oh, <laughs> hey, baby, you know, watch this. I, I could, you, you know, and I, this is just the way men are made. And I'm not talking about how to manipulate people. I'm talking about understanding what makes people tick. And Abigail is so smart about this. And so she begins to speak to David's potential. She begins to look past what he is about to do, and she speaks to his future, and it's so powerful. In verse 24, she fell at his feet and said, pardon your servant, my Lord, and let me speak to you, hear what your servant has to say. Now, she's not his servant, but she's just being humble. Please pay no attention, my Lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool, and folly goes with him. As for me, your servant, I did not see the man my Lord sent. Now listen closely what she says next. This is so amazing. And now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands. Now this is like a Jedi mind trick right here. She's saying, you are not going to do what you're planning to do. You're not going to do what you're planning to do. You know, David had every intention at that moment of avenging himself with his own hands, but then she tells him, the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands. She's looking at all these guys who have strapped their swords on, they're chomping at the bits, they can't wait to do some bloodshed, they're all worked up, and, and now she's telling him, since the Lord has already stopped you from doing bloodshed the, the lord has kept you from this horrible thing and she goes on may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my lord be like nabal and let this gift which your servant has brought to my lord be given to the men who follow you <clears throat> and then she gives david credit for being a better man than he actually is at that moment and this is so powerful in verse 28 please forgive your servant's presumption the Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord. And so she starts speaking prophetically about his future. David, God is up to something great in you. God has a plan for your life. He has a future for you. You're going to have a lasting dynasty. Let me ask you, did David have a lasting dynasty? Amen. Absolutely he did. Not only were his descendants kings in Israel for hundreds of years, but the real mark of his dynasty is that Jesus Christ was descended from David. And so Abigail speaks prophetically, the Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord, and here's why. Because you fight the Lord's battles, and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. Now, we know that is not true. David sinned just like everybody else does. But what she's really saying is, you're not a wrongdoer. That is not who you are. You're not a wrongdoer. You're not like King Saul who kills people just to get even. You're a good man. That is who you really are. And then she says this, even though, because she knows Saul is trying to kill him. Everybody knows Saul is hunting for David. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. Now, what in the world is she talking about? Your life will be bound securely in the bundle of living? What, what is that all about? Well, she's using language that would be used for a wallet or a purse where you take something valuable, generally money, and you'd put it in the wallet or purse, and you would wrap cords around it maybe to make sure it's secure, and then you'd tuck it in your belt or somewhere else safe, and so essentially, here's what she's saying. Even though somebody's trying to steal your life, David, like a, a thief would steal a coin, even though somebody's trying to steal your life, your life is tucked away safely in God's wallet. Now, maybe you don't think of a wallet as being all that secure because there are pickpockets out there and, and other ways to lose a wallet. You know, I remember a time when I was in the Navy and and Kathy had come over to visit me, and we were going to this nice resort in the Philippines, and, uh, but we had to take a bus to get there. And uh, so we got on this bus, and it was jammed full of people. There was no place to sit down. We were just, you know, crowded up. Everybody's standing in the middle of the aisles, and we're standing crowded among them, and that's when somebody tried to pick my pocket. 
I felt the fingers going right up my butt where my uh, pocket is, where my wallet usually was, was located at. And I couldn't even tell who did it because there's there so many people around me. They're all jammed in. I couldn't even tell who did it. But you know what? It didn't matter because I am not dumb, and I've been around the block a couple times. And so before I got onto that crowded bus, I took my wallet out of my back pocket. I put it in my front pocket. And then while we're standing there on the bus, I had my hand in my pocket covering my wallet. Ain't no way nobody's getting that wallet out of my pocket. It is secure. It, no way that is going to happen. And that's what Abigail is talking about when she says, bound securely in the bundle of the living. David, your life is so secure, it is bound up and hidden in God's wallet, and his hand is covering you. No one can take your life away because God is protecting you. He has a future planned out for you and a dynasty that's going to come from you. She goes on. But the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. This is so brilliant. She is taking David back to that day when he was 15 years old facing Goliath with nothing but a sling. She says, the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. And all of a sudden David is taken back to that moment when he was completely dependent on God. When he wasn't taking matters into his own hands. When he was trusting God with everything. And now Abigail speaks again about his future. and She's speaking prophetically again. And, and for some of you, the next section is the whole point of this message. In this section, she essentially asks a powerful question that all of us should ask ourselves. She asks the question, what story do you want to tell when this is nothing but a story that you tell? In other words, David, one day when you're looking back at this incident, and this is nothing but a story that you tell, what story do you want to tell about this situation? Here's how Abigail says it in verse 30. When the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel, because it's going to happen, David. One day you will be king. God is going to fulfill all his promises. And so, David, when you do the right thing now, here's what's going to happen. My Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. David, one day when you're king, and this is nothing but a story that you tell, you don't want to tell a story of needless bloodshed, do you? You don't want to tell a story of having avenged yourself on your enemies, do you? You want to tell a story about grace and about mercy and about God's goodness. Isn't that right? And when David hears it put that way, he comes to his senses, his anger starts to fade, and he sees things in a new way. And then in verse 32, David said to Abigail, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Abigail, you had good judgment when I didn't. Praise God that he sent you to meet me and keep me from doing something that I would regret. In verse 35, then David accepted from her hand what she had brought him and said, go home in peace. I've heard your words and granted your request. I'm not going to kill all the males in your household. I'm not going to kill your husband. Now, the story isn't over yet because Abigail goes home in verse 36. It says, when Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king. He was in high spirits and very drunk. So she gets back and they're partying. And he's drunk, and she thinks, well, you know, this probably isn't the best time to tell Nabal just about what just happened. So she told him nothing at all until daybreak. Then in the morning when Nabal was sober, he probably had a hangover, his wife told him all these things, and his heart failed him, and he became like a stone. About ten, years, uh, ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. Then at verse 39, <coughs> then David sent word to Abigail asking her to become his wife. Verse 42, Abigail quickly got on a dog key and attended by her five female servants, went with David's messengers and became his wife. And they lived happily ever after the end. Isn't that great? 
actually, I, I added in that last part. That's not really there. It, the part about the happily ever after. He did marry her, but she became one of his wives. And the truth is that it never ends up happily ever after when you're one of somebody else's wives, right? You know, but that's a, another story for another day, a different sermon. So let's kind of summarize this story. We have three main characters, Nabal, Abigail, and David. And we have three responses. Three characters, three responses, but only one hero. Nabal, what does he do? He returns evil for good. Because David took care of his stuff. David did good for him. But he says, hey, I am not going to share with you. And then he starts insulting David and his men. Nabal returns evil for good. David was about to return evil for evil, which is the standard response even today. And the response that makes sense to most people. If you mistreat me, I'll treat you back the same way. Makes sense, right? But Abigail sees things a completely different way. And with her unique perspective, she returns good for evil. Now, Nabal is unlikable. He's a jerk. Nobody wants to be like him, right? David is predictable. This is just what we do, right? You know, this is the normal response of people. But Abigail is remarkable. Her response is remarkable. Her wisdom is remarkable. Her approach to David is remarkable. And in fact, there's a sense in which she is way, way ahead of her time. You see, during this time in history, the nation of Israel was in covenant with God. We call it the Old Covenant, right? It's found in the Old Testament. And in the Old Covenant, returning evil for evil was actually okay. You know, it was an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You read the Old Testament law, and David's response fits right in. Today we think it's a little barbaric, but you notice that his men weren't trying to hold him back. They weren't saying, well, David, you know, you're reacting a little too strongly. You hold on a minute. Think about this. No. They were saying, strap on your throat. Yeah, let's go get him. This is great. You know, that's the world they lived in. But Abigail was way ahead of her time because the New Covenant, the New Testament, is when Jesus shows up and he turns everything upside down. And in fact, Here's something cool. The Apostle Peter, who saw Jesus unjustly treated, unjustly arrested, unjustly crucified, Peter, who saw innocent and sinless Jesus treated horribly, and then he saw Jesus' response. Peter, who saw that, wrote these words to Christians of the first century who were themselves being unjustly treated. And Peter doesn't go with the example of David. Peter goes with the example of of Jesus. So Peter says in 1 Peter 3, verse 9, do not repay evil with evil. Yeah, yeah, but Peter, you know, that's only natural to do that. That's what everyone does. Yeah, I know, but do not repay evil with evil. But, but Peter, look what they did to me. You know, I, I, they treated me totally unfairly. It's not fair to let them get away with it. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult come on peter are you kidding you know what about on social media you know what what if somebody insults me on social media what if somebody insults the politician i like on social media you know surely then it's okay to insult them back no not even on social media do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult on the contrary repay evil with blessing because to this you were called repay evil with good in other words whenever you are mistreated you don't try to get even you don't even just try to ignore it and let it go instead you go positive and repay evil with good you repay evil with blessing that other person this is what peter taught and this is what abigail did in other words and he says, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called. If you are a Christian, this is what you have been called to. And Peter would say to you, if he's standing right here, hey, you call yourself a Christian, you are called to repay evil with blessing. And he says, 
To this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. There is a blessing that comes with this. Many of you know that blessing of repaying evil with good. And then the strangest thing of all, because then Peter in the first century quotes David from a thousand years earlier. Peter quotes from Psalm 34, which David wrote, if you look at the footnotes of that psalm, he wrote while he was not yet king, he was still hiding in the wilderness from Saul, running from Saul. And I wonder, what if Abigail's example maybe helped David to write Psalm 34? Peter quotes this psalm of, of, of David in 1 Peter 3, verse 10. He says, for, and then in quotes, this is what David says in his psalm, whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. Now Peter is writing this to Christians who are being mistreated specifically because of their faith. And he says, when somebody mistreats you, when they do evil to you, you're to turn from that. Don't even talk bad about them. It says, keep your tongue from evil, and instead, do good and seek peace. Return evil with a blessing. And where did Peter get this crazy idea? Don't return evil for evil, but return good for evil. Where, where did he get that crazy idea from? He got it from watching Jesus. In fact, he was there that day that Jesus made his famous statement that most of us have heard a thousand times. Jesus stood up and said in Matthew chapter 5, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So Jesus turns everything upside down. He says, You've heard it said, Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. Where do you hear that part about hate your enemy? That's the old covenant, right? That's the way they lived before Jesus showed up. That's the world that David lived in. But Jesus said, I've come to turn all that upside down. You don't return evil for evil anymore. You return good for evil. If you're a follower of mine, that's just what you do. You return good for evil. And in fact, if you're a Christian, then returning good for evil could, could possibly be the most Christian thing that you ever do. It could be the most Christ-like thing that you ever do. So in closing, let me ask three questions to help us apply this to us today. The first question is this. Do I want to really be even with somebody I don't even like? No, you don't, do you? To get even with somebody you don't like is to be like someone you don't like. Do you want to be like someone you don't like? Why would you do that? And why would you do what they do? Why would you act like the person you don't like? Yes, it feels good to get even, right? But wouldn't it be better, instead of getting even, to get ahead? And how do you put yourself ahead? You do that by refusing to get even. You pull ahead by returning good for evil. Here's the second question. What story do you want to tell? Going back to the life of David, there he is sitting on his mule with 400 people behind him, 400 men with their swords strapped on, ready to slaughter a bunch of people. He's only a few minutes away from a whole different kind of story. But Abigail stops him and speaks to his future. And she says, David, do you really want this on your conscience when this is nothing but a story that you tell? Is this really the story that you want to tell? When people ask you, how did you become king? Well, I went around slaughtering innocent people until they all became so afraid of me they made me king. Is that really the story that you want to tell? And this is a question that all of us in this room need to ask ourselves. We should ask it every time we're making a big decision because every event in your life becomes a part of the story of your life. You're probably in some kind of situation right now, and you're making decisions, and you're trying to decide what to do, but one day it's going to be a story that you tell. And so what kind of story do you want to tell? Maybe you've been mistreated by somebody. Somebody said something mean about you or lied about you or criticized you unjustly. And so right now you're deciding, what story do I want to tell years from now when this is nothing other than a story that I tell? 
Do you really want your story to be, well, I got even with them, and, and I became just like those people I don't like? No. That, that's the normal story nowadays. That's what we see all around us. It always has been. But it is so unremarkable. It is so not like Jesus. What story do you want to tell? And I want, you to, I want to urge you to make it a, not a predictable story, but a remarkable story. A story of returning good for evil. I'd like the worship band to come up, and as they come up, there's one more question to ask yourself this morning. And that is, what would it look like for me to return good for evil. What would that look like? When I think about that person that hurt me, when I think about my ex, or when I think about my ex-employer, or I think about that family member who rejected me or stole from me or lied about me, when I think about my parents, when I think about my dad, when I think about that neighbor, what would it look like in that specific incident, in that specific relationship, what would it look like to return good for evil. To use Peter's words, what would it look like for you to be a blessing to somebody who hurt and offended you? Not just ignore them, not just try to get past it, but actually be proactive and actually do something to be a blessing to them, to actually do something they totally do not deserve. And you're only doing it because you want to be like Jesus. You see, in the greatest story ever told, God returns good for evil. He sent his son in an act of love. We murdered him in an act of evil. God, God's own son is murdered, and yet how does he respond? He gives us salvation. He offers us forgiveness for all our sin. He returns good for evil. God returns good for evil, and he wants you and I to learn to do the same. That's the gospel. And if you're a Christian, that is your story. Let's stand for prayer. <coughs> Will you bow together with me? Holy Spirit, I ask you to bring to everyone's mind right now a situation where they were treated unjustly or unfairly, hurt or rejected, mistreated or criticized. And now, God, would you show us how we can return good for evil? Would you show us how we can be a blessing to those who have hurt us? Would you help us to pray for them and help us to be an example of love and forgiveness to them, just as you've done for us? And we thank you, Lord, that even though we sin time after time, even though we do evil, you return good to us. You forgive us. You love us, despite all of our evil. We thank you so much for your goodness and your grace and your mercy to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.